looking at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that surely is at the centre of each of our lives. Everything that we do revolves around the fact that soon we must stand before our Lord and Master and make an answer for the things that we have done. The signs are abundant, aren't they, that the coming of the Lord Jesus is near. We've rejoiced in the Brexit, because this is something which we know Britain has to have an independent role. Um, we see Britain uh, ploughing a pathway which will take her away from the EU. Uh, and we can see that the uh, calling of the election by Mrs May and the result that she had a smaller position than she had before, we can see the hand of God behind that because it's made the EU stronger and Britain weaker because Mrs May would have wanted to have kept one foot in Europe. But with that change, uh, it has meant that the EU has a running, and Britain will find herself pushed out, and probably without an agreement. But then she will be free to carry out the course that God had foreordained. And it's so fascinating how Britain has been working with Israel on the very day that Britain handed over the Brexit letter to the EU she made a, a trade agreement with Israel to boost trade and the Israelis of course are very keen on Britain leaving because they have a very uneasy relationship with the EU and Britain hasn't been able to do all the things that she wants to do because being a member of the EU you have to toe the line so Israel is looking forward to a much stronger relationship between Britain and Israel. And the world is wondering on Thursday when the Russian uh, military manoeuvres start pace, taking place, Zapad, the West, when they expect up to 100,000 Russian troops to carry out their exercises on the eastern borders of Europe uh, and they're very afraid that this will be a step too far. Ukraine is worried that Russia might use that occasion to take more of her territory. We know that Russia has to be a strong military power and that's what we're seeing. And at the same time we, we see Israel having unprecedented links with the Eastern Arab nations to her east and fulfilling what Ezekiel had to say about Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish. So in a wonderful way, all sorts of things around being uh, an assertive power taking over Iraq and moving on into Syria so that as Ezekiel 38 tells us, she is the number one companion of Russia, and we can see the reason why. So all these things, brothers and sisters, are telling us that the return of the master is so close. So what I want to do uh, is just set out uh, a proposed timeline of things that are got to happen between the coming of the Lord Jesus and the kingdom established so that we can just see where we are at this beginning of this uh, series. So I made a series of three headings, it's the saints, Israel, and what I call biblical nations, which are nations which come within the orbit of the Bible. It doesn't mean that they are Bible-fearing nations, but nations uh, of Europe and Russia and the Middle East, biblical nations. As far as we know, the next thing is the call to judgment. It will take place at a time when probably Israel is having a time of peace and security, though that might be after the call, we don't know. And there is this acceptance and rejection at the judgment seat. And there will be, flowing out from that, an Elijah work that Malachi speaks of, of Elijah the prophet and presumably John the Baptist and maybe others, going to the nation of Israel to prepare them for the coming troubles uh, that are about to break forth upon them. Meanwhile, over in Europe, uh, with Britain having come out of uh, Europe, the European will come together as a political unity uh, to form the beast system of Revelation. It is then that the nations of Europe and Russia combine uh, with uh, 
and the two more countries, but to come against the nation of Israel. And that's the Gogan invasion of Israel. And we know that Jerusalem is taken. Two-thirds of the Jews who are living in the land now will be cut off, uh, which is a very frightening picture. And half of those that remain will be taken into captivity. Meanwhile, while that is taking place, the saints are involved with Abraham and others. Abraham going to his other children, non-Jewish children, to the Arab nations, the southern Arab nations, and educating them about the real truth of Abraham and the promises. And then that's the starting signal for the march of the rainbowed angel, to use the language of Revelation, the saints come up to save Israel in their hour of trouble and distress. And what takes place is the Battle of Armageddon. So we mustn't confuse the Battle of Armageddon with the Gogin invasion. The Gogin invasion leads eventually to the Battle of Armageddon, but uh, the Gog coming down against Israel isn't Armageddon. Armageddon is when Christ and the saints come up to deliver Israel from the forces of Gog. And that having taken place, the Gogan forces are destroyed and the kingdom is established in Israel. The saints reveal themselves, the 12 uh, apostles take charge of the 12 tribes of Israel. The, the, the Jews that are in the land at this time enter into the new covenant as uh, Zechariah 12, 13 tells us. So in nucleus it is established in Israel. Meanwhile, over in Europe, for the next few years, there will be a regrouping of the European nations. Revelation chapter 17 reaches its climax there uh, as they band together against the Lamb and resist the call that will go out to uh, submit to the King of Zion. And the saints will be the warriors and the preachers and the rulers assisted by the mortal Jews who are, are in the land, who've entered into the new covenant. Uh, and there will be the call to the diaspora for all the Jews everywhere around the world to come back home. Difficult time of regathering because Jews won't be held in any favour, especially in Europe where the cream of the European armies has been destroyed on the mountains of Israel. So it will be a difficult time for them in being regathered. Meanwhile, a war between Christ and the saints uh, against the false religion of Europe, uh, that takes place in Europe. Um, Revelation 14 speaks of the two harvests, the harvest of the corn, the beginning of the Armageddon, and then a few months later takes place the wine harvest, the gathering of the grapes, representing the warfare in Europe. And Daniel's fourth beast is slain, and the other three beasts, Daniel tells us, have their power taken away. And so step by step, the kingdom extends um, around the world until eventually all nations submit and the kingdom will be established worldwide. So that, that's our time frame. That, that's the sequence that we are looking for if we understand scriptures correctly. Uh, a lot has got to happen before the kingdom is actually established. Now there's a slide which you'll have seen before. Um, I, I propose that there is a 10 year period from the return of the Lord Jesus to his household to the battle of Armageddon. And some time before that will be the Gogan invasion. Uh, how many years or months before they are destroyed, we, we are not told. But uh, Gogan invasion followed by Armageddon, a 10-year period. And to the time when the kingdom is fully established, when the beast is destroyed and uh, Revelation 17, 18, 19 are fulfilled, uh, that period there, I believe, is a 40-year period. There are several references talking as in the days of the coming out of Egypt. So a 40-year period to bring all the Jews back and the kingdom to be established. And that neatly makes a 50-year period which God works in jubilee cycles. Now that's based on this 10 years for the judgment is based upon Leviticus 23 and 24. I've got it up on the screen, but let's just turn to um, Leviticus 23. It's dealing with the feast days 
And uh, in verse 24, it comes to um, on the first day of the seventh month. Now, the seventh month is September, October time. This is the final feasts. This is the beginning of their new uh, year. Um, and it is marked by a Sabbath. Now, all month beginnings were Sabbaths. That's how their calendar worked. And there was always a blowing of a trumpet to mark the first day of the month. But this was a special blowing of trumpets. We'll, we'll look at the detail in a moment. But there was a memorial of blowing of trumpets on this first day. A holy convocation, a special gathering together. And an offering made by fire um, unto Yahweh. So that's verses 24 and 25. And then in verse 27, uh, on the 10th day of that same month, was the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And they had to afflict their souls, they weren't allowed to do any work, and again it was a holy convocation. And again there was this uh, language used of an offering made by fire to Yahweh, it's a special Sabbath. And then five days later began the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkoth. And they had to rest on the 15th, which was the Sabbath, and the 22nd day. And they spent a whole week dwelling in booths. So if we just put a bit of a detail to that, as I say, the, this was a special blowing of trumpets, a memorial of blowing of trumpets. And the idea behind that is that there's a continual blowing. It wasn't just one trumpet blast. And that, of course, reminds us of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. What I'm proposing, that this is in type a figure. This was the final feast, the time when they had the ingathering, the harvest time. Uh, this was a representation of the return of Christ and the resurrection for the saints. And it is a holy convocation, a holy gathering together, an assembly. And it will be the biggest assembly of saints that has ever been gathered together uh, at the judgment seat. It's also a time of dedication and service. That phrase, um, an offering made by fire to Yahweh, has its first place in Exodus chapter 29, which is about the dedication of Aaron and his sons, and is therefore very appropriate for such an occasion. And in verse uh, 18, Thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto Yahweh. It is a sweet savour, an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. And so this was all part of the cleansing, the purification of Aaron and his sons. And verse 25, uh, similarly, um, it is an offering, take a ram, it is an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. And how appropriate the ram, wholly consumed. These people stand here on this beginning of a new era because of the offering of the lamb who was slain and has given his life that these might be there. So, then, ten days later, is this Yom Kippur. Again, another day of atonement. A special day, a gathering together. And I believe that we can see in this a type of the nation of Israel. Having prepared the leaders, now it is the turn of the nation of Israel to be gathered. And a remembrance again made of their sin. That's what the day of atonement was all about, wasn't it? And the scapegoat sending their sins away that they might be remembered no more. So again, how appropriate for Israel being gathered, their eyes being opened to who the Messiah was and the waters that are now springing out from Jerusalem as a result of the earthquake that splits the Mount of Olives. They are baptised into the name of the Lord Jesus, into the new covenant to wash away their sins. And it will be, indeed be a special Sabbath to them. This is the calling, the first stage of the calling of the nation of Israel and their redemption. 
So if we apply a day for a year, then uh, that gives us 10 days, 10 years, from the return of the Lord Jesus to his household to the Battle of Armageddon, which liberates and opens the eyes of Israel uh, and establishes them as God's people, God's kingdom upon the earth. Now, on the 15th day to the 22nd day, from Sabbath to Sabbath, there was this Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkoth. Now, we have to apply a different time scale here. And what I think is, we've got the 10th day, and at the end of four days later, on the eve of the 15th, I believe that the kingdom will be fully established. So this is four days not four years, but this is a case where we have to take a day for ten years. Forty years later, the kingdom is fully established. And then, as it were, the whole earth, as well as Israel, uh, will enjoy the blessings, that celebration of the ingathering of the harvest, which the uh, Feast of Tabernacles was all about. Now, that feast didn't last a millennia, a thousand days, it didn't last a hundred days, that would be far too long on the time scale, so God uses different symbols, uh, and a week is then used um, uh, as a symbol, I believe, of this time period of the kingdom, the millennial rule of Christ. So, with that introduction, let's, let's look at our theme of resurrection and judgment. Now, it's clear from... Paul's dealing in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that resurrection or anastasis, standing up again, isn't just bodies coming to life. It covers the whole process of a resurrection from the dust, a judgment and a transformation to immortal bodies. And Brother Thomas in Anastasis, a wonderful little booklet, uh, goes through this in detail. Uh, and describes the different stages. And there's a seed body, the body as it is raised, a sprout body, the one that stands before the judgment seat, uh, and the raised body, uh, the, the body bringing forth fruit. Now, if we look at the uh, cycle of a seed being sown, and it uh, sprouts and it grows and brings forth fruit, what Paul in Corinthians is saying that is a type of the resurrection. So it's not when it's planted uh, is a representation of us dying and going into the dust of the earth. He's saying that resurrection, this process of anastasis, starts off with a little seed, as it were, a mortal body, and ends up with an immortal, glorious being. That's a process. Sprouted in corruption, raised in incorruption, that final stage of transforming mortality into immortality. And we know that God has preserved, is preserving the DNA pattern of all his saints so that out of dust of the earth, new bodies can be created. It doesn't need the original dust. Any dust will do. And I believe it, it could well be that for the vast majority of saints who died long ago, that they will be raised from dust, recreated from dust in Sinai. Resurrections have taken place in the past, in Old Testament times, New Testament times. But in all those cases, the people were only dead a few hours, or at the most four days with Lazarus. So, the process of resurrection for them was a, a, a body still existing being brought back to life. This goes back as it was at creation of Adam, the body being formed out of the dust of the earth. But with this major difference, that Adam had no previous existence, that was a new creation. But for all these saints created from dust of the earth, uh, having their DNA pattern put, put back in, they will be living persons again. And what Brother Thomas uh, paints in uh, Anastasis and elsewhere 
is that because it is a different process, it's not going to be like Lazarus able to walk out of the grave and uh, you know, recognising being able to talk. He says it will take a longer process. And that's why we read from Daniel chapter 10. Now, sadly, we, I don't think we're going to have time to really look at that. But Daniel chapter 10 is a picture of resurrection, showing it going through various stages of the body being strengthened and more strengthened and more strengthened until it is able to stand. So it's quite a fascinating chapter to study, but um, sadly we won't have time to do it. As well as their DNA pattern, God stores the memories of all his saints. So that the body will emerge looking like the person that had lived before, and their minds will be restored to them. Now, normally we would think that it would be a rest restoration of where a person is at the end of their journey. But there have to be exceptions. My mother died of Alzheimer's. There would be no good raising her in the condition she was when she died. The clock would have to be wound back until she was um, not so confused and so that. And how thankful we are that all this is left in God's hands. He knows what is going to be right. But God is going to recreate from the dust of the earth men and women who have lived and died uh, and restore them back to a measure of strength and understanding so that they can stand before the judge. And it's only after the judgment and acceptance that the final stage of raising the seed, the stage of incorruption, takes place. So let's just fill out a few details. First of all, the emphasis that scripture has that we all have to face the judge. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? And so it would appear that there is in fact a sequence of judgments there is the judgment on the household, that's the first judgment. But there is also a judgment upon Israel, and that's what the Gogin invasion is all about, their final testing uh, and their redemption with Armageddon. And there is also judgments upon the Gentiles. There is also, I haven't put it on there, but there is another resurrection at the end of the millennium for all those that have lived through the millennium those that have died during that period and those that are alive at the end of the millennium are raised, gathered together and a final judgment so that beyond that all will be immortal. So we're concerned in this talk about the judgment on the household and we have to say well where are where is that judgment? Well we're going to look at where the three uh, locations of judgments are. We believe that the household will be judged in Sinai and the three passages which we're going to look at in a moment which point uh, very strongly to that conclusion. Israel are going to be judged in their land and those that have been scattered out of it and have to fight their way back and the Jews who are scattered around the world they will have their judgments mainly in Europe uh, and I believe that uh, they will be gathered via Sinai. That last reference, uh, Ezekiel 20, seems to point that the Jews who are gathered back come to Mount Sinai, and it's there at Sinai that they either accept or reject the new covenant. And if they reject, then they are destroyed. If they accept, then they're baptized into the water uh, at Sinai and then go up into the promised land. The Gentiles will have their first judgment in the land of Israel when the uh, wrath of God is poured out upon those who despise his people. And then mainly from Daniel chapter 7, the fourth beast, Europe, uh, is the arena for much of the judgment of the Gentiles. So Armageddon um, and Revelation 17 speak of those periods. So let's just look at these three references just very briefly. <laughs> 
So the first one from Deuteronomy 33, uh, verses 2 and 3, it is Moses' final blessing, his final words, he's just about to die. Uh, and he's looking to the time of the future. And he sees a, a different set of circumstances to those things that have happened 40 years earlier. Moses says, Yahweh came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran. He came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand. They sat down at thy feet. Everyone shall receive of thy words. That was far from the case um, when they, the children of Israel came to Mount Sinai. This is talking about a future time. When the saints will be in God's hands, in the hands of his son, obedient, thousands of them, 10,000 saints, ready to come forth from Sinai to deliver his people. Psalm 68, again just plucking out uh, one verse there. The chariots of God, 20,000, thousands of angels, the Lord among them, Sinai, into the holy, or from Sinai into the holy place. Now, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they went to Sinai, but they didn't then go to the holy place. And the holy place wasn't established in Jerusalem until centuries later. But here is a picture, the chariots of God, 20,000, thousands of angels, uh, the Lord among them, Sinai, the direction is to the holy place. Now, the authorised version, angels, is a sad translation, really, because it means changed ones. It's just not the normal word for angels. So it's thousands, 20,000, thousands of changed ones. The Lord among them, Sinai into the holy. A wonderful picture of the redeemed saints with their master going forth to save his people. And the final one is in Habakkuk chapter 3. And again, it has this idea of a, a movement from the south up to the north to save his people. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was as the light, he had horns coming out of his hand, there was no, the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence, burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth he beheld and drove asunder the nations and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. And a bit later on in verse 13 it says, Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. So here's a picture of God uh, in militant display and going forth from Timon, Paran, from the south going forth to save his people. So Sinai seems a very fitting place for judgments. Uh, and, you know, where else can it be? I know there's much confusion within the brotherhood. Many think of, uh, you know, God's Lord Jesus is going to come back and we're going to be gathered to Jerusalem, but that, that cannot be. There has to be the judgment first. And Sinai was the place where Israel became a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And this is where spiritual Israel become his kings and his priests. So, very fitting place, out of sight of the nations. Just as when Jesus ascended, he didn't ascend from Jerusalem, they were out behind Olivet, they were at Bethany when Jesus ascended. And so, in the same way, Jesus is not going to come back to Jerusalem initially, he's going to come back. Uh, we believe, to Sinai and gather his people there. And so it gives us a logical sequence. as a resurrection, a call to the saints of judgment, and the larger work, invasion of Israel. These are things that uh, we looked at in our opening slides. So who's responsible? Who's going to be called to that judgment seat? And we have to say, well, it will be those that understand the gospel message. Brother Roberts, uh, Christendom Astray, responsibility Godward, only created by contact with divine law, 
in a tangible and authorised form. In other words, it's only people who have come in contact with the truth rightly expounded who will be responsible. If they choose to reject it, um, they will still be involved in the judgment seat. And later on, um, in another writing, that men are responsible to the resurrection of condemnation who refuse subjection to the will of God when their circumstances are such as to leave them no excuse for their refusal. So that's what our pioneer brothers thought about um, the basis of judgment. And we have to say, we don't know. God, it's in God's hands. And again, we have to say how thankful we are that it is in God's hands. But it seems clear that there is a responsibility associated with hearing the gospel message. And at some stage there becomes a responsibility which is uh, to make them, uh, if they reject it, still responsible to come to the judgment seat. So children are excluded. Um, we'll talk about children in a moment. Uh, and those lacking mental abilities. There's another statement which Brother Thomas makes. The light shining into the darkness and divinely attested makes sinners accountable and saints responsible. And this is with reference to the Jews in Jesus' day. He says that the Jews of Jesus' day, because they not only heard the message, but it was divinely attested by the miracles, that those who rejected that message are responsible and will be brought to judgment. And there are three references there. One is about uh, Caiaphas. You know, you'll see um, when I come in my power and glory, um, you, you will see it, which indicates that the leaders there certainly will be um, raised. But the other two references also indicate that there was a responsibility for those that heard the message but chose to reject it. They saw the signs, they saw the miracles, they heard the words. They are responsible. But interestingly, because this wasn't a matter I had thought about, but um, Brother Roberts, looking at the majority of the Jews, going way, way back um, during the time of the First Kingdom, the national suffering of the Jews in dispersion and privation are evidently a full discharge of the responsibility arising from national election. So Brother Roberts says that because they have suffered as a nation, that is sufficient, their punishment that they have had. There won't be the calling of all the Jews that ever lived to stand before the judge. Obviously, there will be saints among them, men like David and Abraham, these. But um, for the vast majority, they lived and they perished and perished forever. So, how are we called? Well, there's just a little hint in John chapter 11. Um, we recall this is prior to the raising of Lazarus. And Jesus has come to Bethany. And in verse John 11 and verse 28, Martha um, goes and calls Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. Now, I know it's a different scenario, but it is linked with the resurrection of Lazarus. So it, it could well be that somebody that we know is raised from the dead and comes to our ecclesia on a Sunday morning and we would know beyond a shadow of doubt that the Lord must have come. There has to be some signal that is so convincing and maybe it is only a speculation but maybe a recently dead person, we would know the master has come. 
So we looked at resurrection, so let's now look at the judgment seat. We know that Jesus is the divinely appointed judge. Just a few references here. Uh, he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. That's Acts 10.42. Romans 2.16. In the days when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And again, Corinthians, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And similarly, Romans 14, verses 10 and 12, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So then... Every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So that's making it very clear that we all have to go to the judgment seat of God. And we all have to give an account of ourselves. Now that word account is logos, which occurs quite frequently. But in the particular context, um, Vine says, an account one gives by word of mouth. Uh, and Thayer answer or explanation in reference to judgment to give or to render an account so when paul is on trial and uh, agrippa says you know you're free to defend yourself he stands up and defends himself gives an account of, of his life so those are the clues that are given to us and surely this must involve the angels um, sorry, there was another quote there, 1 Peter 4, 5, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. So I, I believe it will involve, in the first place, uh, long discussions with our angels. We all have angels who are overseeing our lives. We'll have perfect recall of everything we have said and done. And it is they that will be responsible for untangling all the tangles that we have got into it can never be brothers and sisters that we in the mercy of God go into eternity wondering why brother X or sister Y should be in the kingdom we have so many hang ups don't we so much has to be sorted out between brothers and sisters uh, as well as uh, answering for the things that we have done so I believe that will be the work of the angels. Um, that the final pronouncement of well done or I never knew you will be from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So what is the basis of judgment? Does scripture tell us? And I believe that Ezekiel does. And again, it's very appropriate that Ezekiel is the prophet that God uses to convey what it is that we're really going to be judged on. Ezekiel was the prophet that saw the vision of the temple uh, and therefore the kingdom age. And in three different passages, principles are set out. And we're just going to read the Ezekiel 33 accounts, but they're all very parallel. So Ezekiel chapter 33. And what we're going to see here is that it, it's not a matter of pluses and minuses and therefore a, a balance, you know, have we reached a pass mark. Now God doesn't work like that. What, how God works is how we are at the end of the journey. That's what's important. Uh, and how wonderful that is because it, it matters not what we've done in the past it, it's what we do now prior to the Lord's coming so um, verse 10 therefore O thou son of man speak unto the house of Israel thus she speaks saying if our transgressions and sins be upon us and we pine away in them how shall we then live say unto them as I live saith the Yahweh I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, 
but that the wicked turn away, turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trusts to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness is, shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. And again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, if he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge, etc., etc., verse 16, none of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. And so it goes on. And so I think that establishes a very... Simple principle, brothers and sisters, and a very heartening one, that it's where we are at the end of the journey that we shall be judged upon. So we don't have to despair about our past. We can reach out to the future. Jesus gave two parables of First place linking with the things happening with AD 70 in the previous chapter, but we can rightly take them. And we know how there were five virgins and five virgins, both lots slept. But the five wise virgins, they knew what their Lord wanted. The Lord wanted light, illumination, to illuminate his path when he came to take him to the bride chamber. And they made preparation for that. They knew what their Lord wanted and made preparation for it. And though they slept, that wasn't held against them. Because when the call came, they were ready. They got their oil. Whereas the unwise, or the foolish ones, hadn't thought about what their Lord wanted. And so again, it's a big excitation to us. We know what Jesus wants from us. So what are we doing about it? That's why we've got to look at our lives and see. And the parable that uh, followed that of talents, again, shows that God doesn't expect more from us than we can do. There are five talent people, there are two talent people, but we have to use whatever talents we've got to the full glory of our God and not bury them away. So sobering lessons for us. So, the master's return, I know this is going back, but it was triggered because, I say, there is a lot of confusion uh, in the Brotherhood. There's a recent three-part video about getting to meet Jesus, where it's proposed that the dead are judged, then there is the invasion of Israel, and then the living saints are caught away to the Lord, the unfaithful ones are left behind. They don't have to be judged. Um, and somehow all is revealed at Armageddon. Well, that's not what scripture teaches. And there's a very simple test of when the resurrection takes place, the call of the master, when the master comes. And in Revelation 16, which we know applies to our day and generation, we have verse 14 describing the preparation for the nations to come to Armageddon. And then in verse 16, he tells us that he gathers them together to Armageddon. And in between is, behold, I come as a thief. So clearly he comes before Armageddon. And we are all called. This idea of uh, being left behind and being caught away is a misunderstanding of uh, the scriptures. All are, have to stand. We all have to be judged. So how long will the judgment take? Well, simple answer, we don't know. Um, but it, it's not just a you know, flick of the fingers, as it were. This is a matter of eternal life and eternal death. 
and I think it will take several years. And if we're right that there is this 10-year period, you know, there's ample time for this period of um, judgment. And I believe, too, that even for those who are accepted, that there will have to be a period of time, and again, this is just speculation, but a period of time of adjustment, because the change from mortality to immortality is a step we, we just cannot comprehend, can we? But we have the parallels with marriage, that two people going their own ways in a single state come together uh, in order to marry and live together, uh, and it needs a lot of adjustments. And we have this period that we call engagement, where there is this uh, sorting things out and readjusting for this changed state of marriage. And so I think there will be some time needed in education and preparation for this change which will take place in an instant from mortality to immortality but all within this 10 year period so what will happen to the children of saints who are called away to judgment this is obviously a matter which is of concern but God is always caring when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, the children went with them. And there was no problems about that. And if there is this 10-year period before the saints uh, go to war, then any baby that is taken to judgment, by the time the saints are ready for their action, uh, any babies will be 10 years old and will be under the care of the angels, uh, and when the kingdom is established, will be able to be taken care of by uh, Jewish people. Um, let's, uh, let's just turn to Isaiah 56. We're nearly at the end. I'm sorry, it's taking longer than I thought. Isaiah 56 speaks of a time period... Um, Verses 6 and 7, also the sons of strangers that join themselves to Yahweh to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Um, and verse 14. No, sorry, that's chapter 14. We won't, won't look at those. But the, 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 the indication is, in several passages, we talk about the sons of strangers. Now, just as when the children of Israel went out of Egypt, there were Egyptians who joined themselves to Israel. So there will be in this day when Gentiles will see God's blessing upon the nation of Israel. But I believe that some of those sons of strangers, sons and daughters, will be children of believers... And they will live in the kingdom age, live and die, but they'll have their opportunity of attaining to a resurrection uh, at the end of the millennium. Uh, and so will have their opportunity for immortality. And in the ages of eternity, what's a thousand years that they have missed out? God takes care of our families. So... All response will go to judgment. It's not a case of only accepted being taken. As I say, that's a misunderstanding of one taken and one left. Um, in the context, in AD 70, those that were taken were taken to be killed by the Romans. So that wasn't salvation at all. Um, and uh, Daniel chapter 12 um, and Romans 2. But we push on. So the fate of the rejected... They have to die again. Those that have been raised from the dead, now what happens to them, whether they die at the place of judgment, whether they are sent back into the world, we're not sure. But it would seem reasonable to think that those who are gathered alive to the judgment seat and rejected will be sent back to their homelands to tell the people that the Lord Jesus has come back. Uh, and maybe that's part of the elements that 
ensure that the English-speaking countries, as we would see it, the merchants of Tarshish and their young lions, are at hand to serve the new king. But there is a fate, there is a death, an eternal death. And uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat. Every man may receive the things done in his body. So there is a, a physical rejection, mourning, punishment for those who uh, are rejected at the judgment seat. Uh, and again, Romans uh, 2 um, those who are disobedient, there will be indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish. So not an easy time. And Daniel chapter 12, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame, and everlasting contempt, everlasting in the sense of belonging to that age, not forever and ever and ever. So, the change to immortality is the final stage of the resurrection process. Anastasia will be completed. And then will be the instruction of the saints as immortal beings into the matters of the seven thunders, which uh, Revelation tells us were sealed up. John was told not to reveal them. But they contain the details of the battle plan that the Lord Jesus has in establishing the kingdom. Uh, and those details will be revealed to the saints who will be responsible for carrying out those judgments. So, brothers and sisters, uh, a wonderful, exciting, but a fearful subject. For saints, this is the one true reality in life that we will stand before our master and judge. And in his great mercy, may we be granted a place in that kingdom.